Donc, euh, bonjour et bienvenue euh, à cette euh, table ronde sur le thème de euh, la physique et de la philosophie. Comme vous pouvez le voir, je suis fait de Comme vous pouvez le voir là, sur le titre, la discussion sera en anglais. Euh, néanmoins, dans la partie question à la fin, si vous ne sortez pas de poser des questions en anglais, vous les en français, il n'y a pas de souci, on laissera les traduire autant que possible. Et euh, voilà. Donc euh, maintenant, je vais vous passer en anglais. Ça fait que je vais vous dire que je suis en anglais. Merci à vous d'être là. Uh, before I present you, I will give, uh, give a brief presentation of the idea of this uh, table, the run table, and of uh, the idea of the data physics. Because I think I don't, I don't need to define the world history, but probably most of you or some of you are not familiar with the idea of meta metaphysics. Uh, meta metaphysics, roughly speaking, the inquiry into the aims, methodology, and meaning itself of, meta of metaphysics. Now you could legitimately tell me that. Uh, That's a weird uh, choice of words since uh, the uh, methodology of metaphysics was part of metaphysical practice in the history of uh, philosophy. And indeed, uh, I tend to think that Kant's uh, critics of pure reason is one of the best examples of what metaphysics is supposed to be. And uh, the question of what can I know is a paradigmatic question of metaphysics. But so, why, why, uh, why set it up as a separatory, uh, separate discipline? It's because today, uh, if you take the uh, original meaning of metaphysics as the inquiry into uh, the fundamental structure of reality, today it's challenged by science, and uh, a lot of uh, scientific realists tend to think that there is no legitimate metaphysics outside of uh, metaphysics only in science or invisible to scientific knowledge. And thus, we have a crisis in metaphysics today, and in this crisis, where you have a uh, tradition that, that tends to be hegemonic. There is uh, interest in uh, going to a further level and try to have a neutral, neutral arena where we can discuss epistemology and metaphysics and try to resolve the tension that we had at the first level. So that's also why I think this conjunction of history is very interesting because, as in uh, every topic, when you have a uh, tradition that has dominates, it's uh, useful to look at history and look at, at the fact that uh, it was not always the case that the tradition uh, as it is today was uh, before. So it's, it's a good idea to temper our explanation of what metaphysics should be with a uh, look back in the past. And also the history of metaphysics is a wealth of inspiration for contemporary metaphysical discussion and trying to go forward to resolving the tension and find new areas, new ways to metaphysics. So that's why I want to, uh, want, we wanted to have this uh, <coughs> we have, I invite the speaker here, uh, Thomas Tato. So now we present our speakers. Uh, so first of all, thank you very much, Thomas Tato, for coming from the uh, University of Bristol. Joe Stacco is a professor of metaphysical science and a faculty research director at the University of Bristol. He is uh, the one that's responsible for the popularization of the world of metaphysics. <laughs> <laughs> and so he's our uh, expert in these, these topics. Uh, that's why, he's, uh, why we are very thankful for his being there. Uh, he's also a specialist of Aristotelian metaphysiosophy and of the uh, question of a priori, a posteriori in metaphysics, question of uh, essence, grounding, modality, the way that you have been doing a lot of stuff, very interesting stuff in these uh, topics. And so your, your presentation uh, here, you start with presenting, I have the title somewhere, sorry. <laughs> yeah, the title is just the action. <laughs> Essence, the idea, and existence from Isotope Analysis and to Computer Metaphysics. Next, we have a presentation from uh, Jacob Schutz. What's well, Jacob Schutz? Uh, thank you very much for the universe, uh, for to start with. Uh, you are a professor of history and history of philosophy, specialist of 15th to 18th uh, metaphysics, history of metaphysics. Also, the change of uh, modern classic metaphysics, if I'm not mistaken. And your talk today will be uh, more about how meta metaphysics is a way to uh, reinvent or, or, or uh, rethink the methodology of history in a more unhistorical way to compare different metaphysical systems throughout history. And uh, finally, uh, Alexandre Gay, who from SFIDA, so thank you for being here as well, for asking to talk with us. So, uh, um, as you may know, uh, Alexandre is a specialist of uh, philosophy of science and metaphysical science, mostly a philosophy of physics, now going to metaphysical biology, if I can say it like that. And uh, you will talk today more about the a posteriori tendencies in metaphysics and the ambition to have naturalized of metaphysics. So, the, 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 the table will be uh, uh, set up in uh, three different presentations uh, at first. Short, then, short, short, short presentation from 10 to 15 minutes. Then discussions, and at the end, we have 30 minutes of open questions. So, if everything is okay, I'll uh, first you. Well, thank you very much uh, for, for the very generous introduction. I want to do justice uh, it's, it's a real pleasure to be here. Very nice to see, see you all. My first time in the world. Um, so, I, I will try to keep this, this brief as, as agreed. Uh, 
And uh, I suppose I should say that this is uh, something of a, a very brief case study on the interface between history of philosophy, contemporary metaphysics, and science, or philosophy of science. Um, so, I mean, the title sounds like I'm going to, to do a lot of things, but, uh, but I'll just give you very, uh, a very brief example, because that's, that's all I can really do in, 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 this, uh, in this time. Um, and I, I always had a habit when I'm, when I'm talking about history of philosophy. I'm not really a scholar of Aristotle or, or Avicenna because I can't read the original language, sadly. So, so I always rely on, on uh, valued colleagues who are really doing the, uh, the exegesis. And, and uh, I, I, I trust them with judgment. So, so any, any mistakes are on my own. Very good. So um, the case study that, that, I, uh, that I propose to you concerns substantial kind change. And I'm going to give you an example of, of what that is. But I'll start with um, a rudimentary uh, distinction between three related views um, about what is essential to individuals and what is essential to kinds. So, so distinguish these, these three, three views. It's essential to individual X that it belongs to a given kind, called <coughs> individual essentials. So it's essential to a given individual, for instance, uh, um, uh, a biological organism that it belongs to uh, a given species. That's a that great example. Second view, each individual member of a given kind, K, say a biological species, has a general essence or natural kind essence, which, which might consist of one or more properties that are essential to all members of, of that, uh, that kind. So some shared properties. This is a pretty standard formulation of what might be, might be called natural kind essentialism. Although it's controversial, of course, what those properties might be that are shared between the kinds, especially in the case of biological species. The, the third one I'm not really going to focus on, but it's worth distinguishing as well. I'm calling it uh, sui generis essentialism. So the kind, if we, the kind is a kind, uh, is, a, is a kind of well, entity itself, um, might have an essence, which might include the fact that each of its members have certain shared properties. Uh, so if the kind is universal, its essence would involve all that as well. But I'm mainly going to focus on the first two here, all that sort of um, uh, dilemma, well, dilemma, dichotomy that it arises from. Okay, so here's, here's the problem of substantial kind change. It's possible, or we might think that it's possible, for an individual, let's say, cat, to become a dog while retaining its individual essence, so remaining the same entity. So we might make a claim like this. So individual cat tibbles could be transmuted into a dog with some sort of process and still remain tibbles. Is that possible or not? Well, that kind of change of species membership, kind of membership, would violate uh, the first of the principles that I gave you, so it's essential to the individual X that it belongs to kind K. But it wouldn't necessarily violate the second one because the kind doesn't, doesn't change there. So uh, the general essence uh, uh, of the kind doesn't, uh, doesn't enter into the picture when an individual changes its, its kind of membership. Or if it, if it is possible, an individual changes its kind of membership. To give another example from um, chemistry or physics, uh, consider Beta, beta decay, beta minus decay, where a weak interaction converts an atomic nucleus into a different atomic nucleus. So I think an example is carbon 14 to nitrogen 14. You can correct me if I'm wrong. <laughs> so it seems like we might have an individual atom uh, changing into another atom, changing its, uh, its kind. So that as well would violate uh, the first principle by not another second. So the question is, should we accept this kind of kind change, substantial kind change, or remain committed to essentiality of kind membership? And that's a question that we can ask in contemporary metaphysics, and it's certainly a question that we can ask in the historical life. So that's my, that's my case study. So I've got a text here now from Adam Senna, uh, which speaks to this issue, but it speaks about a lot of other things as well. But I'll, I'll quickly, quickly read it and give you the, the relevant part. So Adam Senna writes it. If one supposes, say, that at some moment there is no color but white, or any other form of more than infinite colors, it would then be true in an absolute sense with respect to absolutes of mode that every color is white across the line. Whereas prior to that time, the truth of the statement would have been possible. This possibility is not true if it's associated with the predicate, for it is not possible in the specific sense that every color is white. On the contrary, there are colors here that are necessarily not white. Likewise, if we suppose a time at which there are no animals but men, 
it would be at that time, according to sort of this mode, that every admin was mad, whereas prior to that time, this would have been true according to possibility. If you fly to a predicate, however, possibility would not have been valid. There's a lot of stuff happening in this passage, and I'm not going to unpack it all, and I should uh, nod to Yari Kao, who my, my Finnish colleague, who is a, a scholar of, of Aitana, who's uh, uh, used this text in, in another context. Um, but there's something happening with kind membership in this, in this group, and there's something happening with modality, the identity modality in particular. So the question of kind chain has, has a historical precedent, and I'll, I'll say a little bit more about this now. It has obviously a root to, to Aristotle. Not an actual quote to say, but I'll take my word for it. And uh, Aristotle and Senna famously both regarded species to be eternal, so they would have denied the kind of uh, substantial kind change, presumably, that I'm talking about. So Aristotle would also reject, uh, and maybe Aristotle too, the coming into existence of any new animal species, and notoriously so, because that does seem to conflict with what we know. And we see this. Uh, in other examples as well, such as this Avicenna quote, so Avicenna discusses the impossibility of other colors becoming white. So he's focusing on, on their rare possibility, um, which, uh, which involves the kind itself uh, and uh, uh, allows for some sort of a deadixon possibility here. But the thought here, of course, is something like this not that a non white object couldn't become white, or individual objects can change their colors, but rather the color white itself. Uh, or the color black itself could not become white. So the kind itself can't change. So this would seem to be uh, compatible with the, with the second natural kind of centrist view that I outlined, but not the first one. Okay. So both Harrison and the center would seem to deny the possibility of kind change in this sense. And uh, this is a view that is shared by some contemporary philosophers. My, my um, uh, late mentor and PhD supervisor, E.J. Lowe, uh, notoriously was a little bit on the fence on this question of substantial kind change, which is one reason why I think it's an interesting case study for, for uh, contemporary meditators as well, because uh, it's, it's difficult to accommodate um, uh, substantial kind change if you, if you are committed to a certain amount of essential experience. Okay. So, now we get to this question, what, what should we make of the lessons from science then, when we know from contemporary perspective that some kind of substantial kind change would, would seem to be happening, like the, the beta decay or, or the Darwinian theory of, of species. So what, what should we say about this? Can we reconcile this type of essentialist metaphysics familiar from history and also from contemporary, contemporary metaphysics at all? That, if you like, is the metaphysical question. Can we, can we somehow reconcile these, uh, these different positions? Well, one way forward, I think that helps, is to deny that there are any individual essences at all. But that is not to undermine essentialism. You can still say that there are natural kind essences or general essences in the sense of the second view that I would like. But you deny that there are individual essences making the first option redundant. So Socrates' humanity is shared by all of us as, as humans. We all share the same natural kind essence in this sense. And my reading of the, uh, of the Aristotelian scholarship is that Aristotle and perhaps Alexander would have been sympathetic to this option, that there are just general essences, and we all share the same kind essence in this sort of sense. So that, that will help you get some way to, to accommodate this type of kind change. But still, if essences are immutable in the sense that certainly Aristotle and Amazon seem to have helped, how could species change over time? How can we accommodate uh, evolution in, in this type of picture? That doesn't, that doesn't uh, uh, immediately get solved even if you abandon individual essences because the kind itself seems to change all the time. Right? So how, how could you possibly do this? I think that it does solve the beta decay problem. You, you would just deny that the individual atoms have something like an individual essence. You know, what happens there is one uh, member of a given kind goes out of existence and another member of another kind comes into existence. No violation of uh, the essential principle need. Well, I suggest that there's an answer to this question as well, and it has something to do with a broader question, a metaphysical question, if you like, uh, related to Aristotelian imminent universals. So, uh, Aristotelian universals that need to be instantiated to exist. Right? Okay, so I think this is my last slide, so I'm getting get done in 15 minutes. So, if we regard natural kinds to be substantial universals, so a, a 
a fundamental category in there, all right, as I as I do, and, and as EJ Lowe famously did as well. And I think we can say I support my sympathy so much. Then um, these kinds can't exist without instances. So you don't have any kinds without instances. At Armstrong calls this principle of instantiation. So it's, it's also featured elsewhere in contemporary metaphysics. Now that gives us a problem uh, for for those kinds, you know, considered dinosaurs, where, where there's no instances anymore. That kind seems to have come kind of out of existence. But as Lowe puts it somewhere, such universals shouldn't be conceived of existing in time. You should really take uh, a four-dimensional eternalist picture of these kinds. Their instances exist in time, but the kinds themselves do not exist in time. So as long as you have an instance of a kind at some point in the past or in the future, you can say that that kind exists in a, in a sense that we're interested in. It. And in that line of thought, we should conceive natural kinds, such as biological species, they are natural kinds, as four-dimensional. I suggest that's where the Aristotelian essentialist, or Arizona, for that matter, has the answer to the problem of Darwinian biology. Because each of the species presumably has the same origin, assuming that we are dealing with one evolutionary tree. And if we accept that, then no matter of speaking, there is just one kind of biological species. And we are all members of it, and all the animals and all the plants and everything that is a living being is a member of that same kind. And it's in the essence of that kind that it evolves over time in the way that it does. But it doesn't change as such. It's uh, to be conceived of four-dimensionally. So if it changes over time, it does change over time in a, in a matter of speaking. But uh, if in an eternalist, the four-dimensionalist picture, you shouldn't have to be worried about that. Just as you don't have to be worried about those kinds that have come out of existence in history. OK. Now the question, of course, is, is this type of four-dimensionalist or eternalist picture compatible with Aristotle's or Aristotle's picture? I don't know what the right answer to this is. Abitana has conflicting passages on whether the future is open or not. And I was recently in a conference at Edinburgh where this very question was debated from, from both ends. Um, so Yari Kalko claims that any kind of seeming open future there is just an epistemic modality rather than a metaphysical modality, whereas some others disagree. Now, I don't claim to have an answer to that question, but I think that this is an interesting case of uh, the history coming in, the science coming in, and contemporary metaphysics coming in, and uh, we can make some progress by bringing these views together in quite an interesting way. All right, thank you. Thank you. Shall we go straight to, to Jane? Yeah. Well, we can, if, if there are precise questions on this, we can also, uh, I don't know, you're the boss, but oh, I think, yeah, yeah. Since I will, uh, sure. I'll get to some more more general things than that. Mm -hmm. People okay. might forget about okay. species well, and, and Dar Darwin, but it's as you like. Yeah. Okay. But, uh, if there is a specific question in this talk, before we move to general, no? Well, okay. Well, th thank you um, to uh, Kevin and also Florian for, um, for masterminding this and for also giving us um, I mean, the reason I'm here and Alexander is here as far as I understood is that um, we are an institute where uh, philosophers of science and historians of philosophy don't always talk to each other. So um, I'm very happy that this happens. Um, I, um, I have decided basically to, to just make some general comments and remarks about what this meta-metaphysics that, as uh, Kevin said, um, uh, Thomas is one of the most important proponents today, what it has to say, not for us as philosophers, as we have already shown now, uh, but just for my own profession, which is basically um, history of philosophy. I'm a pretty dull historian of philosophy. I don't make big claims about, um, about whether kinds are eternal today in biology. I have no clue. I don't know. Um, my, my ambition is to just make um, as as good as possible interpretation of texts of the past. So um, let me start first with one thing I thought, um, because I have discovered your work a few years ago already, and as you might all have seen two years ago, all European news agencies came up with good news for especially our Finnish colleagues, because for the eighth year in a row, Finnish people were declared the happiest people on earth. <laughs> 
by the World Happiness Report. <coughs> and the Danes were not far, um, if you were not far. And the Belgians didn't do that badly. Uh, eight years, that's almost what separates us from the publication of Tuomo Stacco's introductions to metaphysics. Correlation <laughs> 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 is not causality, we all know that, but there is clearly, I would say, from my point of view, something refreshing and optimistic in your project. Um, just compare it with, some, with what some of the most prominent representatives of the angry and depressed old continental nations have to say about metaphysics over the major part of the 20th century. Oh, sorry, for that, to give you my little handout. Um, let's just, just get it through. I'm not there enough. <laughs> I keep one from it, sorry. Um, so just compare it with what some of the most prominent representatives of the angry and depressed old continental nations have to say about metaphysics. France, in particular, was downgraded in the report this year. Angry people these days uh, mainly seem to speak German or French. Husserl, famously, uh, claimed, this is text number three, that we must disconnect everything metaphysical, I translate, alles metaphysisches muss völlig zurückgestellt werden, because it only leads to a degradation, a degradierung of scientific reality, and thereby jeopardizes the very project of a theory of knowledge which should not be about imposing our concepts to the world but trying to receive the structure of the world itself. Two decades later, as you know, his most famous student and definitely an angry white man turned the central idea of Husserl's theory of knowledge into a full-fledged historical program. Given that metaphysics was both at the heart and the top of classical European philosophy since, an since ancient Greece, one had now to work towards, I quote, text four, destroying the traditional content of ancient ontology until we arrive at those primordial experiences in which we achieved our first ways of determining the nature of being. The program of destruction went paradoxically hand in hand with a systematic reconstruction of the emergence, development, systematization, transformation, and decay of metaphysics from Aristotle to Nietzsche. Rarely has an author dedicated so much time to reconstruct something he hates. Certainly a reason for depression and angriness. <laughs> The strong impact of Heidegger on certain strands of post-war philosophy, especially in Francophone lands and now in the Far East, has led to a continuous application of this protocol and has provided us with a number of studies on the historical constitution of metaphysics from Neoplatonism to the Middle Ages in particular. We have spoken about Avicenna. I mean, the first big studies of Avicenna came out of a Heideggerian inspiration. I mean, in the West, I mean, the first Western Heideggerian uh, Avicennian studies. And so I would have led to that, or on studies on potential escapees, people who escape from this horrible narrative, some Neoplatonists maybe, or some mystics from the Middle Ages. Phenomenology, finally, then could be called the best post-metaphysical philosophy, a program that in the case of France, for instance, has been pursued in the phenomenolog phenomenological reading of, just to quote one example, text five, Jean-Luc Marion, an undertaking to free presence from any condition or precondition for receiving what gives itself as it gives itself, phenomenology therefore attempts to complete metaphysics and indissolubly to bring it to an end. Since over 20 years now, we keep having books on not the end of metaphysics, but the end of the end, la fin de la fin. Since now it is assumed that metaphysics is dead, we should drop, stop writing about its illness, but develop a new philosophy, freed from it, capable of abandoning all the evils and temptations of objectification and reification. Now, I am, as you know, a historian of mainly medieval and post-medieval scholastic philosophy, as Kevin has uh, recalled, which is a tradition famed for having coined the vocabulary of ontology, and which also ventured into the meta-word game, 
inventing new sciences such as meta log meta logic meta logica and meta ethics meta etica but alas i have not so far found meta ontologies nor meta metaphysics i will try however not to be an angry historian of philosophy and therefore believe we can learn something from the general program of uh, Tuomas's meta metaphysics as a methodology for practicing history of philosophy let me start with just reminding those of you who don't know, I know I have some, some maybe some students also here, um, that two of the most general statements about metametaphysical philosophy given by Thomas, which I have reproduced here in text one and two. Metametaphysics is the study of the foundations and methodology of metaphysics, whereas meta-ontology deals exclusively with the study of existence, quantification, ontological commitment. Metaphysics encompasses these areas, but also broader issues, as you have shown right now. I would like, for the sake of opening the room for discussion, address very briefly two questions, highlighting both what I believe are the virtualities, but also perhaps the limitations or doubts I might have about what this approach can yield uh, for my own sub-branch of history of philosophy. And I will address them for discussion. The first question is about whether metaphysics can free us from the implicit normativity of historical reconstruction, and the second about the way meta-metaphysics meta meta can treat the problem of historicity. And your paper today, I mean your presentation today, gave, gave us a good example. Concerning the first point, I believe that the great number of historical debates about the history of metaphysics have indeed been plagued by implicit normative statements about what the proper object of metaphysics should be or what the proper way of doing metaphysics should be and hence how bad other metaphysical traditions who do not do that are. So, example, if you are a Neoplatonist, then of course metaphysics is not about being but about God and if you do ontology, you're just playing with words and not grasping reality. If you are a Scotist, so followers of John Don Scotus, general metaphysics can only be about being, its famous transcendental properties, it's in text five, uh, text six, the famous text by Scotus, and God can then only become a part. This is even about method. If you are a humanist, and I give you here in text eight a Louvain example from a Louvain humanist, then you believe metaphysics should help you to reach the sky and happiness. Josip Lichtove, metaphysics is a supernatural art which leads us to celestial contemplations with the help of the inferior sciences. I don't know if you promised that to us. <laughs> uh, but certainly in, in the context of Lichtove, who was a, a low countries humanist at the same time or a few years later, if you were a Calvinist or a Protestant, you certainly did not believe this was the case. Metaphysics could not bring happiness nor bliss. And you should stitch to what they called, finally, the Catholicity, the Catholicity of things that is the universal predicates and transform ontology into something that has nothing to do with God at all. Famous quote here from the definition Leibniz would inherit from ontology is text nine for your memory. The famous statement, ontologia est scientia de aliquoi nihilo. The most successful historical metaphysical systems in history have usually been those that have to some point managed to compatibilize several of these perspectives. One can, of course, here think of Avicenna and the Islamic tradition, and it is certainly also one of the appeals, a century-long appeal of Thomism in the West. I gave you also for memory the famous prologue of Aquinas' commentary on the metaphysics, uh, which is an interesting text because he gives three different ways of understanding the first things, God, common being, or first causes, and this means that you can, from, on the basis of this text, have a very strong geocentric reading of Aquinas' metaphysics, which is good for some, or a very ontological reading, which is also a way that has been followed in history. And I think you can say the same about Avicenna's metaphysics, who had basically um, also in the Islamic tradition itself 
followers who actually read him really in a very Neoplatonic way, and of course others, mainly the Latin ones, who read him in a very ontological way. So I think that the successful systems are those that actually allow these multiple uh, readings. Um, now, against uh, these narratives, I believe a meta metaphysics downplays or helps us to downplay these normative claims from the side of historians. Rather than enshrining one specific position as an historical absolute and the correct conception of metaphysics, existential interpretation of Aquinas, transcendental thought, criticism, according to Kant, and, and these are the only proper ways to do philosophy, right? Uh, I think the method uh, you defend um, is freeing us from this normative statement because uh, you invite us, basically, to sketch always the different possible positions that are available for a specific philosophical problem. Uh, you give, in your book, for instance, you, you say that the debate about ontological commitment, we should, in the whole debate about ontological commitment, I, I advise this chapter to students because it's very clear, we should systematically identify four meta-metaphysical positions which cannot simply be ordered like in a chronological or historical order, but which are all structurally possible solutions. Ontological realism, ontological anti-realism, deflationism, and conventionalism. These are all claims from us meta-metaphysical positions because they assume a certain type of relationship between mind and world or on the foundations of concepts. Whereas realists would happily confess to be metaphysicians, conventionalists or nominalists in general would usually vigorously protest against such a denomination and call themselves anti-metaphysical. That's why we have difficulties as historians of philosophy to talk about nominalistic metaphysics. Now, you prove that we can talk, of course, about nominalistic metaphysics from a meta-metaphysical point of view, because conventionalism or nominalism, of course, has certain fundamental um, assumptions, and that is what meta-metaphysics is basically trying to analyze. So by showing that even what does not classically count as metaphysical relies on certain types of metaphysical assumptions, the shift from the metaphysical anti-metaphysical alternative to a meta-metaphysical perspective is, I believe, a very good tool for research. Um, now, just shortly, sorry, I'm not, I'm not talking, uh, I just have shortly to my second part of my question, which is perhaps more, a more open question. Yeah. Um, as such, I think that the meta metaphysical approach as a methodology seems also to share certain elements um, which have been popular in certain countries in the history of philosophy, in particular structuralism. Uh, they have shared with structuralism a certain, I would call it, anti-historicist conviction. And I would like to have your opinion on that, especially we can use the example you gave. Um, I say anti-historicist, not anti-historical, because just in the case study you gave, you say, yeah, we can easily make these authors, we can dialogue with those historical authors. But now I'm not talking about anti-historical, but anti-historicist. Uh, in the sense that the meta metaphysical outlook rather gives the impression that similar forms of realism or anti-realism can pop up at different moments of history. Right? Rather than assuming, what a historicist would say, that they actually do not have anything in common. Even if they, they look similar, they actually do not have anything in common. Um, the advantage, of course, of such a timeless approach, uh, which I think is at the core of the, the whole tradition that does now meta metaphysics, is that it justifies, of course, to treat past authors not as purely antiquarian, antiquarian objects of interest, but as true partners in discussion. My doubt, however, or a doubt that one can um, voice, is whether metaphysics can remain sufficiently attentive to historical differences in certain fundamental um, metaphysical positions. Is metaphysics compatible with some form of historicist claim, or does it reject it altogether? I'm not thinking here, of course, about the historicism of the angry German science Geschichte, nor about the angry neo-Thomist narrative of decline and fall of Western metaphysics. 
I'm thinking here, just give this one example, and it will please somebody in the room, I think um, a more happy form of historicism, um, as it was, for instance, practiced in pre-war Oxford by Collingwood. Although it is a very understated form of happiness, as the happiness of the British upper class is, it is <laughs> nevertheless, I think, a rather happiness, happy form of historicism, in the sense that it is completely or largely devoid of the romantic longing for a lost age that it would be much better, and this sort of disdain for, for our contemporary age. But it does make one strong claim, namely, that metaphysics is, and I think I gave also here the quotes, 11, 12, and 13, uh, metaphysics, it's quote 11, is a certain class of historical facts which Collingwood then defines and calls absolute presupposition. The key example he gives for such absolute presuppositions, defined as one which stands, text 12, relatively to all questions to which it is related as a presupposition, never as an answer, are, for instance, all the statements about causality. And that is something one can relate to contemporary discussions in metaphysics about grounding causality dependence. Collingwood argues that the different senses of causation we use, for instance, are themselves historical fact. And therefore, an absolute presupposition is not just, that's my last quote, 13, a presupposition innate in the human mind, but it belongs, it's a nice formula, to the mental furniture of a certain age, which can be long or short, depending on the, 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 the thesis. Now, I think your example here, um, uh, you gave today is, is actually really fitting because uh, if you ask whether substantial universals exist in time and you deny the fact that kinds do exist in time but you accept that the instances exist in times is of course as you have hinted at the end also a commitment to a certain conception of time and that conception of time, whether it's an open future or a closed future, for instance, would be, I think, an absolute presupposition. And that absolute presupposition, is it, and that's my question, it's a Collingwoodian question, is it just a formal possibility of the human mind? Okay? Or is it something that is rooted in a historical culture, uh, civilization, cosmology, which perhaps we do not really understand now because what we extract from Aristotle or Avicenna is just one specific thing. The example you gave that we are all part of one kind is of course linked to creationist metaphysics in Avicenna, which we don't care about when we talk about natural kinds today, for instance. So that is, in a certain way, um, the question I, I, I would have. So let me finish. Um, um, and again, in the paper I read two days ago about the happiness of the Finns, a colleague from the University of Helsinki explained that the Finns were so happy, I quote, because they have a more attainable understanding of what a successful life is compared to the German and the French. <laughs> so that might be a very interesting claim also about our practice of philosophy making and history of philosophy, making us less ambitious in the reconstruction of ancient or medieval or early modern position might yield better results than having this uh, idea that, um, of course, there is some unique, perfect form that has been either forgotten or has to be reclaimed. So my question is, for the discussion with Thomas and with the people around here, so what would be a reasonable, to quote that researcher, attainable metaphysical program in the history of philosophy be? Dispensing ourselves from the high ambitions of not only reconstructing, but also interpreting the concepts or propositions we study in their own historical framework, or rather as some atemporal floating entities, I would be very curious to have your opinion about this and on whether meta-metaphysics has some place for historicism or whether we should reasonably just get away with it. Thank you. So, I'm sorry if I should move on to that. I think we came to square. I don't know why. So, so what, what I will say will be pretty close, in fact. Pretty close. So, I'm happy, so it's not complete garbage.
<laughs> <laughs> so, I have been a philosopher of science for a long time, and for a very long time, philosopher of science have been making huge ontological claim, and only until very recently we, were, we begin to say, we're doing metaphysics. <laughs> and now it's institutional. There's a society of metaphysics of science. So when it appeared, less than 10 years ago, it was, these are my people. So I went on the website recently, just to, to say if they changed their mind, because I did not, and I, did, I, I could not be in, I can't know. Let's see. So on their website, they say, what is metaphysics of science? The metaphysics of science, the abstract investigation of ontological issues arising within or emanating from the science, blah, 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 drawing on a wide range of philosophical literatures, and you're like, oh, these are my people. But the next paragraph just crash everything. Kantians, <laughs> <laughs> garbage. Neo-Hegelian, garbage. A priori, garbage. <laughs> it's explicit on the website. It's not, it's not hidden. And it's just after this paragraph. So if you're doing that, you're not doing metaphysics of science. And where does it come from? This is, this is weird. We pass from, and that's the normative claim you were saying, we pass from, we don't do metaphysics as we are the only one doing metaphysics. <laughs> so of course, pedagogically, you know that. But, uh, but I will, for the people that, that are not close to uh, Anglophone philosophy, there were a bunch of big books that framed the, the debate. You know, the metaphysics within physics of modern Metaphysics, and so far it is concerned with the natural world, should look at physics. But not just physics. Physics theory. Theories. Period. All the rest, garbage. Everything must go. Your colleague. <laughs> <laughs> you know, naturalistic metaphysics exclude everything else. You know. But by this we mean metaphysics that is motivated exclusively by attempts to unify hypothesis and theories that are taken seriously by contemporary science. For reasons to be explained, which is not very clear in the book, we take the view that no alternative kind of metaphysics can be regarded as legitimate at all. It's not, it's not oh, they are a little bit wrong. They are completely wrong. Let's continue. It's fed. <laughs> or swing the project of metaphysics of nature if it's evenly presupposed the view that the pretension to knowledge contained in our scientific sources are not baseless. Therefore, you have to be a scientific realist. Any scientific theories that is not compatible with, with scientific realism is not, not even wrong. Baseless. So we pass from a no metaphysics in philosophy of science to a very hegemonic world, which is normative. And obviously, not a lot of people wrote, read your book, or maybe they read what they are against. <laughs> so I will show four cases where this normative approach in the history of philosophy makes the, 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 the problems difficult to understand. First one, I'm sorry, it's only in French because I did not find any translation of Emilie du Châtelet, but I will not read. But Emilie du Châtelet, great mathematician of the 18th century, among the best, wrote a big book, Institution de, de Physique, in which she argued, uh, she tries to make sense in the metaphysical position between Leibniz and Newton, and she agrees a lot with Leibniz. Uh, no, with Leibniz philosophy, but scientifically with Newton, because she's, she's one of the only people at that time that could read the Principia in, in the text, able to understand it. And she argued very strongly that the gravitation law of Newton is not explanatory, because it's not thick enough, modally, to, to explain. However, a few years after, like three years, three or four years, she translated, in her translation, the only French translation, by the way, of the Principia. Mm -hmm. There's no translation since 1755. That's an interesting <laughs> point, historically. She says, ah, by the way, attraction, it's great to explain everything because it's light modeling. So, of course, if you are 
realist. You just look at theories to have the ontology. This move is impossible to understand. And my claim is that this normative approach of metaphysics makes you less understanding this problem. And you see that probably what happened, it's not that suddenly Emilie du Châtelet understood Newton. She understood Newton better than anybody before. By the way, uh, this is the source of, uh, of um, her lover, uh, Voltaire. Voltaire. She, this is the source of Voltaire on Newton because New, Voltaire is unable to read anything scientific, scientific. <laughs> but he's defending the English spirit against the French spirit because of the English Châtelet is explaining to him every part of it. <laughs> so my claim is that it's a philosophical move, not the scientist move. She did not be, become to understand better Newton. She just moved her interpretation of modality. She passed from a, a mechanistic world to probably a nomological world where the equation could identify a real modality in the world. Other example, which is even more troubling. Now, this guy that we study all the time wrote a magnificent small books. And he's a very, very good reader of, uh, of, of Newton. Because if you read Newton's, Principia of Newton's, there's three books in the Principia. The first one, there's the three famous, what we call Newton's law today. Newton's law, inertia, definition of force, action, reaction. Newton calls them axiom. He does not call them laws. Because they are not laws in his mind. In his mind, they are the framework of all possible mechanics. And it's only in the book three where he discuss gravitational law, which is a, a, a law in our world. So there's some bizarre model discussion in the original text that not a lot of people saw because they, not a lot of people can read Newton in the text. Can can't read Newton in the text. He understood, and he tried to make sense of this. This is completely forgotten. Because if you read every theory, gives you your ontology, it's just a, you read the theory, and suddenly the ontology is uh, hitting you in on the head. These nuances are not there. You need someone that has had some sensibility about different program of metaphysics. I'm not arguing for his program, <laughs> I'm just saying. The fact that he was not a realist helped him to understand this nuance in the modality. And this one <laughs> that you said. On one there is the famous paper of 1948, Ontological Commitment. Every people doing metaphysics of science, when I ask them, why are you justifying to read the ontology just in the language of the theory? They say, on the, what there is, 1948. These are the two last sentences of what there is, 1948. For among the various conceptual schemes, one, the feminist claims is epistemological priority. So, so, so wine was a, a strong empiricist. Uh, that's okay. Viewed from within the feminist conceptual scheme, the ontologies of physics objects and mathematics objects are myth. <laughs> that, that's, that, did they read the same? <laughs> they are myth. The quality of myth, however, is relative, relative in this case to the epistemological point of view. So it's a better myth than the gods, because we can make cars with that myth <laughs> and laser. This is, this is a metaphysical position. He has a certain conception of metaphysics, close to nominal, nominalistic. I'm still puzzled about how they read these papers. And even in the last example, even inside their, their teams, that's, that's Simon Saunders, famous philosopher of physics from Oxford. He wrote a very important paper, Are Quantum Particles Objects? Where he argues using, I'm losing my voice now, where he argues using and coins, coins and techniques, that quantum particles are not absolutely discernible, a property usually considered necessary for individuality. However, fermions, not bosons, but fermions, are weakly discernible. Therefore, mm, they have some individuality in a certain sense. They are individualized by their relation. 
And here there's a jump, okay? Should we conclude that there are no individuals in quantum mechanics, which he's saying, because we have a framework, Aristotelian framework, or should we revise our framework and say, okay, the concept of individuals that was really grounded in organism, in Aristotle, should be abandoned and transform. But this choice is not obvious. It's a choice about what is the methodology of metaphysics. Of course, all the realists, they chose this one. Okay. Lady Mann, for example, chose this one. They said, okay, the concept of individuals from Aristotle garbage, we should take this one. Forgetting that, in fact, most of the discussion about individuals in the history of philosophy is about organism, which are very specific kind of individuals. So, almost a conclusion. <coughs> so, if we take metaphysical, that, that's one of my weird papers. So, if we take metaphysical projects and we, look, we divide them in three categories, of course, classification is bad, but. It helped me to think, and, and I cannot think without the graph. So, so that's me. Okay. So here is where is the main epistemic authorities in your metaphysical project? Is it science? Is it common sense or manifest image? Is it neo-Aristotelian stuff? What is your favorite method? And what is the goal, the, the goal of the project? Revisionary metaphysics or descriptive metaphysics? So these guys are saying that this this part of the of the of the fruit is the only one. That is good. And they particularly dislike traditional metaphysics a priori revisionary or descriptive. This is this is this is that. And they dislike this one because this is the empiricist or neo hegelian However, there's other possibility, even inside people, inside the, the teams that people think science as the main, there's other possibility than this one. Even without discussing the other one, inside people taking science as the main authority, epistemic authority, you could do something else. You could do descriptive metaphysics, like uh, study the scheme of how human beings are understanding basic categories, like that, the neurologist is doing some kind of applied metaphysics to the mind. Or you could be a purely I said the philosophy, it's, it's a progressive deduction of metaphysics of science to a series of steps. Or you could even and, uh, get interested in, uh, in weirder stuff like, um, like Denmark, you know, the, the physicist that published that everything is a mathematical structure, and we are a mathematical structure trying to understand other mathematical structures. Why not? Okay, but obviously he has a, another meta metaphysics, another methodology of metaphysics. And why exclude them at the beginning of the inquiry? I don't understand. Now, now you cannot. I can not even go to the society of metaphysics of science because obviously I should not be there. You know, I'm not a realist, so I'm uh, on the worst side of history. That's the normative aspect that I find deplorable, but I like your your approach. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, is there any question in this talk? No. So thank you, all three, for a uh, nice presentation. So open the uh, discussion. If you no know you're free, so whoever wants to start first. So. I have to say something. Thank, thank you very much. Really, really fascinating talks. Which uh, did, did you coordinate beforehand? Because you have the same point, don't you? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so that I'm really sure. Yeah, yeah, it's very good. We did that. Um, well, first, let me say, as the former president of the Society of Benefits of Science, <laughs> I, I wasn't aware that there was a text from the website. <laughs> but you're very welcome. Uh, I don't think it's an exclusive bunch, uh, but but the uh, philosophers of physics may uh, have a strong voice in that group. But I wasn't aware of that. Anyway, uh, so I mean, the, the normative point is is, is really interesting. 
uh, that, that you both make, and I, I, I think that there's, there's something more that we can, uh, we can drill down on, on, on that. Um, I'm, I'm tempted to bring in an example, which I, I, should, I should say is uh, something that my PhD student, Pyro Sura, is, is, is working on, working on meta, meta physics and meta ethics. And, and uh, he's developing this interesting, interesting point, which I think is related to what you're saying as well, uh, that um, there, are, there are those views uh, in, in metaphysics that are deflationist or <coughs> perhaps anti-realist, um, and uh, might, might say that, well, look, you know, maybe inspired by Amy Thomas or something, something like this. Um, the, the, the look, uh, when we're doing metaphysics, uh, we're really doing, doing something else than, than what well, the quite new project for one thing, but also what the what the contemporary metaphysical realists are doing, where we, we should be we should be engaging in, uh, for instance, ameliorative projects or political projects, you know, in, in contemporary metaphysics of race or gender, we see we see a lot of this, and uh, that sort of motivation is, is influencing a lot of this this sort of emerging metaphysical tradition, but but Pyro makes an interesting point that to to say that, you're going to have to make normative assumptions as well, just as you've both pointed out in, in these other examples. Um, because if you don't have any, any kind of real normative principles that you can appeal to, then uh, you can't make those decisions of what, what metaphysical position is better. So, so if, you, if you want to have an ameliorative project, it better be based on some normative values. Right? Uh, so it turns out maybe you have to be realist about normative properties in order to do deflationist metaphysics that's guided by ameliorative goals. So again you're making you're taking a metaphysical position, no matter what you call it, um, which is which is guided by, by normative principles. So I think Jacob you asked it whether we could get around these normative principles in some ways. But but maybe this suggests to me that maybe we, we cannot Get around them. Maybe we should just acknowledge them better. And uh, now, here from you, <laughs> that, uh, there are implicit normative principles like this guiding a lot of the contemporary methods of science already, anyway. And if that filters through to what you might do in history of philosophy, then again, you've been influenced by it. So maybe, maybe the starting point should be here that. Um, that's part of the meta metaphysical picture as well, which I haven't really acknowledged myself in either uh, in, in my work because I often assume the kind of realist approach just you know to get the discussion going. So I'm I'm, I'm uh, fascinated by this from both of you. But uh, I'm not claiming that the, that metaphysics is without norms because every metaphysical project is normative in a certain sense. Yeah. But if you acknowledge it and you are in the system that the metaphysical project is more like a posture like a stance mm. than uh, than uh, than uh, a project aiming at truth where where you could compare things that are close enough okay we can debate it inside the metaphysics of science what is the best way to, to proceed but maybe about other kind of project of metaphysics we just have to okay Let's see how your stance can go, and we cannot really compare because we don't have any meta norms, or maybe there are some cutting wood or something about deep, deep yeah. culture stuff. But to my knowledge, there's not a lot of meta norms in uh, in metaphysics. Norms that every kind of metaphysical project could agree on, mm -hmm. except we're looking for the objective reality, blah blah blah. That's not much. <laughs> well, I, I, I don't know if I, I agree with the idea that, because we're not talking about the same thing. Uh, he, he's talking about the true picture of reality, as you said. I'm talking about the true picture of the past, which is dead. So, of course, all historical metaphysicians, all historical metaphysicians make normative claims. That, that's why we remember them. Okay. My point was rather what should we do as historians in front of these normative claims? And I think a, long, a big part of our history of philosophy has been choosing one of these 
past positions as the good normative claim, and therefore all the rest is either evil or at the worst, uh, or at the best just an anticipation or, um, or something. And, and so we embark on, on our historical uh, enterprises, which are very time consuming, as you know, and you're friends and you really, you know, you talk, Kaka, who really does, and I said, it's very time consuming, with sometimes very thin <laughs> presuppositions, I think. Um, so, what I think I perfectly agree that, a, of course, a historical author makes a normative claim in the sense that he or she believes that the system he or she defends is better than, is a, than, than the other one, is a better explanation. However, we as historians, should we endorse these claims? Um, and, and I think a big part of 20th century historians of philosophy have done that. And I've always been annoyed by that. That's why I found the perspective you offer um, as quite refreshing in a certain way, because you start, you make claims, of course, yourself. I mean, you, you defend a realist position as basically the most sensible. But before doing that, you basically sketch the specific answers different metaphysical positions can give about a specific problem. And I think that was a bit what you wanted to say, too, is that in the, in the, in the tradition of metaphysics of science, you're not an outcast if you're not committed to that specific type of realism advocated by Esfeld or others. And I think as a, as a methodology, and I use that a bit in my own course design when I do historical courses, I, I think it's good to use like a non-normative approach of the different positions that are possible. And then, of course, um, you pick and choose the one you think is the most sensible. But as a historian, as an historian, you should not do that. I mean, that's my own position. <laughs> as, a, as an historian, I try to refrain from doing that. I, I, I try always to reconstruct the positions by saying, well, that's the advantage of that position, that's the flaw, that's the disadvantage of that one. But I'm not trying now to say that, that this one is better than the other one. Because by doing that, you also commit yourself to not seeing what other positions are potentially, <coughs> what, what have to say, what they have to say. So I think, of course, I agree that you cannot completely go away from norm normative claims. But my question was really whether the historian should do it or not. And if we can practice what I sometimes call myself a very empiricist or empirical history of philosophy, we're trying not to make these normative claims. Uh, as a non-historian, I think it makes sense, but I don't know. I don't know. Of course, the Society of, of Metaphysics of Science, they want to propose ontological claim about the objectivity, the objective truth, whatever that is. Uh, at least they try. And when you were interested by the problem of species, of course we are interested because biology is struggling to have a good concept of species right now, and we are trying to solve it. Not the same for when we read Aristotle mm -hmm. in Europe, so we read it. Well, I mean, solve it is a strong, strong word there. Just to contribute. <laughs> so, so, I mean, if, 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 we, if, we, if we try to get as neutral position as possible in the, be it in the historical or in the contemporary realm, then, then my appeal is to that type of method that you mentioned in passing, which is mapping the possibilities, right? So, so if, if you acknowledge that you're, you're mapping the possibilities and <coughs> about a given historical author or about the objective nature of reality, <laughs> whatever that might, might be, if you're in the business of mapping the possibilities, uh, then uh, the normative normative part comes in where you uh, where you take a stance, if you like, and, and say, well, I think this is the best one of those possibilities. I'm going to commit to that one. But um, uh, you could retain a level of neutrality without, uh, if, if you uh, do not make that commitment, if you, if you just say that you're in the business of mapping uh, the possibility space, uh, you know, and leave it to leave it to others to choose from those, if you like. You know, all my papers where I don't take stands and I do some kind of graph of position are the more cited. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so obviously there in the community there's a there's a need for classification or different classification, mm -hmm. different approach. 
No, it's true. It's true that now in philosophy we're used to take position, especially in the anglophone world. And the strongest, the weirdest, the better for your character. <laughs> well, the polemical, like 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 my colleague James Lederman <laughs> and, and, and Don Ross. Uh, yeah, it's just a polemical position, but of course it's an obvious position that they take, even if they don't call it that. And they're, they're, the one they are against, it's clear. Yeah. <laughs> Like, uh, see if there's yeah, if you want to people to no, oh, okay. Okay. Yeah, don't, don't yeah, when, yeah, it's, yeah, uh, when it's finished. Yeah, for an hour. But see if you have no more things that you can open to public something. Please. Yeah, not surprisingly, I have a question. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, but, well, very, very uh, stimulating. Uh, thank you. Um, first of all, I make a distinction between. Uh, uh, ontology and metaphysics. Mm. Uh, I tend to, to use the word uh, ontology to refer to the uh, to the science of what there is, you know, and this is given by our best science uh, uh, under a uh, scientific realist interpretation. Now, metaphysics uh, uh, is uh, uh, is uh, something that uh, deals with the existing entities that the collection of uh, of which, uh, with uh, experience, is more tenuous, you know. And uh, <clears throat> I certainly uh, uh, buy the, the uh, embrace the project, you know, of uh, developing a metaphysics uh, inspired by science. And you took uh, uh, Alexandre, you took the example of the uh, concept of individuality, and then I am sympathetic with the revis revisionist. Uh, uh, conception, which is induced by some results uh, in quantum mechanics, which is, uh, after all, a very, very successful, uh, successful theory. But then, as you say, there is some leeway, you know, in making choice and, and taking a stance. And then, if you have a, uh, some leeway and you have uh, the possibility of taking uh, several posi uh, postures or stances with respect to uh, uh, metaphysical orientations, because what is individual? That's really a metaphysical issue. Experience not going to tell you immediately or even indirectly what uh, what counts as, as as an individual. So if this is correct, and I think this is correct, then uh, how can you defend a, a, a uh, natural naturalistic uh, metaphysic in a strong sense? Because then you, there are some, as you said, also there are norms coming into the picture. So uh, every every stance or posture is. Uh, uh, linked with uh, some specific norms, and so uh, the, the, the connection of, uh, of those norms uh, and postures with experience is is uh, is not naturalistic anymore. I mean, it's not science, uh, and so it's something which goes beyond ontology and which is genuinely, I think, metaphysical in, in this sense. So uh, I think you can you cannot defend a meta naturalistic metaphysics in a strong sense that you would read uh, a metaphysics from the from the, the current uh, scientific theories. You can you might be you may be or you must I think to be inspired by the scientific research. But science as such will not tell you what an individual is, but it can it can also show you that well if you want to keep the notion of individual in metaphysics, there are something that contradicts science. But on the other hand, science is not going to do to tell you what exactly an individual, or where should be an individual, where should be the right concept of an individual, uh, which is a metaphysical, genuinely metaphysical concept. Uh, I'm smiling because I had the exact same discussion with Jonathan Bow. Oh, right. <laughs> <laughs> but you're absolutely right. I should smile also. Yeah, you're, absolutely, <laughs> you're absolutely right, Michel. That uh, the distinction between ontology and metaphysics is not as present as it should in uh, in, in the anglophone world, the uh, philosophical world. So, the, the discussion of ontology in a certain framework and the question of metaphysics is often conflated. And so, I think we should bring back this distinction. It would help the debate a lot. Mm -hmm. But uh, in, in that case, uh, I'm quite... Probably, I'm not sure that my colleague, but I'm quite 
uh, in ag agreeing with you that the naturalistic ontology, okay, but the naturalistic metaphysics, it's very difficult for me to understand what exactly it would be, except some kind of study of natural language of the scheme, or conceptual scheme of the human species, or I don't know, some, something else. On the other hand, I see how when you're already convinced by naturalistic ontology, the project of naturalistic, which is mostly James Hickey and all these people, they are they are using the word metaphysics, but in fact they are yeah, yeah, mostly more, 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 they are mostly yeah. discussing about ontology in the, in the old sense. They, they, I'm not sure they would like to stop there <laughs> to say, yeah, we're discussing ontology, but the notion of individuality, modality, maybe we should not have too strong claim about modality that I think they won't stop there. Even if the grounding of the discussion is less and less clear, uh, especially, for example, structural realism, anti-structural realism, when they had to, to answer uh, the claim, where is the modality in your stuff? That was difficult to get that from a scientific perspective. Maybe not impossible, but more difficult. That, that is, though, where the metaphysics uh, re, re enters the structural realist picture because uh, it, it is part of at least the way James defends it that there is objective model structure. And he has to, or, yeah. or, or, or the structure of mathematics. Quite, yeah. They are, the, they are the same. Yeah, so I mean, but that's where the, the view differs from someone like Van Crossen, you know. Mm -hmm. Doesn't want to bring the modality in, you know, but then it fails. So that, that is, <laughs> on the other hand, that's a good case because when James, uh, we argue against James saying that if you don't commit to any kind of modality, in fact, you cannot distinguish uh, physical structure from mathematical structure, and there's all argument from Russell with that word forget. Mm -hmm. He said, oh, okay, so let's add modality now. Ha ha. <laughs> If I had modality, I know that a physical structure is not a mathematical one. But you see how the argument was the, was was built. It's not. It was not naturalistic. It was an old physical arguments from philosophy of language of 1910 that says, or you commit that every structure is mathematical. Tegmar, Tegmar is quite comfortable saying that, uh, or you add something to patch patch your theory, mm -hmm. which is not naturalistic in, in the in the method. It's more debate of metaphysics that we can recognize between cost benefits, exploratory power and things like that. Values, a debate among values. Yes, but on the other hand, you know, when you know that I defend the, the metaphysics of cost of powers. And I think you know that you know powers and dispositions that are are rather strongly connected with uh, with uh, uh, experience. Uh, I know that there are things I can do and things that I cannot do. I'm pretty sure of that. You know, otherwise, otherwise I'll die you know, simply very quickly. And uh, uh, so if you have the notion uh, of potential or power, well, you have, like, you know, the power of the sense, you know, you, you have everything. I mean, you have potentiality. Uh, but the notion of power is pretty much, I, I think, connected with, uh, with, with experience. So it's it's naturalistic in that sense. It's not scientific, but it's a, it's a, it's a, 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 you know a, you can be an, an empiricist philosopher. Uh, you can be an empiricist without being a naturalist. Uh, and uh, so uh, I think you know you can a version a rather soft version of naturalism, which is pretty reasonable reasonable empiricist uh, uh, position. So, so there's an interesting. I'm, I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna refer to another PhD student of mine who is working on working on this <laughs> aspect, uh, looking at looking at Mark Franson and the Empiricist project there. But but a key part of that project is uh, well, arguably tied to uh, uh, the denial of unobservables. Uh, so so that's part of the core part of the Empiricist. <coughs> We, we don't uh, refer to the unobservables, or we don't include those in our talk. Yeah, but our uh, positions are not observable. 
Presumably not, no. Uh, and, and you know, know that. And but actually, 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 you're things that science talks about as well, which, which might be naturalistic. naturalistic. So, 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 so I think you're right in that. You can be naturalistic in a sense. Well, you can be empiricist in a sense, but not be naturalistic in that. And I'm committed to all these philosophers that science has. I mean, I'm, I'm interested in now in, 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 in how you understand naturalism because uh, you refer to it many, many times. I mean, I, when I teach this to students, I say, well, it doesn't really mean anything. <laughs> because there's many people who claim to be natural. Now, everyone says that they're naturalists nowadays, almost everyone. Uh, unless they're imprisoned. <laughs> You're not naturalists. But I just say well, I'm naturalist, and I think that a prior reason is a core one. <laughs> so, I'm curious about what Jane thinks about naturalism in the physics. There's a, there's a history of natural motion. So, how do you see it featuring in the history of philosophy? Is that was there an incident in how we can understand naturalism from there in a, in a way that isn't quite so, um, uh, kind of so with stance like that, really, it's just whatever your position will be. Um, sorry, I was just trying to discover a tech mark. <laughs> <laughs> just to apologize because I, I, I was interested in this. I didn't know. Him, so I was like, I a case. <laughs> yeah, that seems a quite radical case. <laughs> Interesting fellow. Um, so sorry, to, to get to your question. Um, yeah, I don't want to put you on the spot, but I'm just, uh, I thought you might have some insights on the history of uh, the naturalistic project because. You know, there was a time when philosophers weren't so separated from scientists. Yeah, no, of course. Um, well, um, well, again, I mean, it, it goes back to the question I had: whether the concept of nature we use is is really always the same. <laughs> um, it's not. It, no, it's not. So that's why I'm asking whether it's whether your approach is compatible with a form of historicism or not, eventually, yeah? Um, the, the, the idea that nature... It's very complicated, as a question, I must say, because the contemporary work on... The, the, the standard narrative, of course, has always been that uh, philosophy and science were the same thing because we had a common concept of nature, which was itself normative in the sense that the proper observation of nature should provide us with a proper understanding of, um, well, metaphysical concepts such as powers, for instance. It's because we see that seeds in the spring make flowers that we start developing ideas of dispositions of powers and so on. And so we believe about the objectivity, I mean, that's the standard sort of narrative, we believe in the objectivity of the those concepts because they are to a certain extent related to a sort of naive vision of, 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 the, of the universe. Uh, but now, as, and you know that better than me because you've worked more on philosophy of nature than I, than I have ever had, uh, over the last 50 years nobody actually buys into that narrative anymore <laughs> besides some, I don't know, really very sort of maybe, I don't know, neocon, neoconservative thinkers. Um, nobody buys into that, that method even by saying that even Aristotle or the ancients, they did not just have an observational ontology in the sense that their ontology was actually not just concepts taken from a naive vision of the universe, but it, it was an ontology that was itself, well then you can you have the debate, either linked to grammar, I link to politics, that's the whole new feminist deconstructionist reading of the ancient metaphysics. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, so from that point of view, I think, well, uh, history, of, it, it really depends on the concept of nature you use and how you, how you understand it, if you understand it as something given or as actually something constructed. And then you have all the different options, whether you assume it's constructed by language, which is the whole sort of neolinguistic interpretation of texts of the history of philosophy, whether it's constructed by social practices, which is now a very strong trend, um, but which goes into a very weird direction sometimes. So that from that point of view, I, I much more prefer your formalist approach. <laughs> uh, to, to but I say that all of these could be conceived as naturalist projects if, uh, if you just slot in the, the relevant 
conception of nature. Yeah. Yeah. <coughs> yeah. I think that's that's probably that's probably right, and that's why the notion is very helpful in some ways. Mm. <laughs> Mm. But on the other hand, things are changing. For example, for empiricists, we were never talking about modality. And that modality was a bad word. Mm -hmm. And some start from agentivity, abstract from agentivity, and we have Woodward. We have the conception of, uh, of Woodward of causality, which is clearly abstracted from agentivity and making mm -hmm. it abstract. And it's not purely observable. It's by it's, you start from a first-person perspective, you abstract and you get to this abstract modality inside a very empiricist tradition. Woodward? Uh, uh, Woodward. James Woodward. James Woodward. Uh, but also, uh, my, my PhD student that wrote Model Empiricism, <laughs> the Model Empiricism book, saying that based on planification of experience. When you do an experience, you, you expect something, you try something, you're not just observing and hoping for the best. And there's constitutive of these choices, some model claim, implicitly. And so, so surprising for empiricists that were really allergic to any kind of modality. Now, this seems to be empiricist mean to get to modality. Maybe it's not the modality that James Woodward would like, but but it's it's surprising that inside these stands, these stances evolved. Like when Ellen Bibi was doing the Merci Cher here, she said, okay, there's the Lewis stance, there's this stance, then this stance, and they they develop a lot in the history of philosophy from their, their founders. Because people develop them, uh, improve arguments, but the problem is compare stance among each other. Inside a stance, we can discuss, but when you go to another stance, how a neo Kantian could discuss with a realist, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. probably there's nothing to say. Except, yeah, I have more explanatory power. What is explanatory power? It's inside my stance. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Well, one question, Jürgens. We don't have questions, but not so important, but, 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 but um, um, I was intrigued by something that you said in your talk um, about uh, uh, when you were describing kind of a more neutral way of presenting positions uh, by uh, just talking about advantages and disadvantages, but not committing or something like that. But how can advantage and disadvantage be disadvantage? Be how can this analysis be done in kind of a neutral way? Because if you call something an advantage, that's like the, the that's really a normative uh, stance to me. And, and there's always like some and also like going to this space of possibilities without choosing, considering something a possibility is probably because there is some, some normative principle that, that makes you, that, 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 that opens up this logical space of things. Uh, so while I am very attracted to the, the more neutral approach, I wonder how feasible it is. And certainly for somebody like me who is interested in non-classical logics, where even on what is logically possible, you can have discussions, um, is it, I mean, is this neutrality not just replacing some kind of dogmatism by some other one that is then supposed to be more general, but therefore also less uh, defeasible or something less uh, um, flexible because you have like gotten to this point where you see the whole of logical space and nothing can be questioned anymore because, well, uh, um, now we are just like objectively looking at advantages and disadvantages everywhere um, from this like super perspective. <coughs> so it's it's like an open <coughs> suggestion for no, reflection to all of you, but that was triggered by something uh, Jared said. Well, thank you. Uh, it's a, it's a good point, um, and it, it's it's actually. Um, Something sometimes students complain about me 
<laughs> and then they, they come up at the end of the course and say, so, where do you stand? <laughs> uh, where do you stand? Are you a realist? Are you anti-realist? Are you... So, uh, because you're always trying to give the pro and cons. So, as you know, I spent most of my adult life reading scholastics who do all the time pro and cons. And then sometimes at the end of the day, you don't actually know what they were really saying. But you have a lot of good arguments for one position or against the other. But then you, at the end, I agree, that's, what, that's why people sometimes, well, were anti-scholastic. Because they said, eventually, these people don't commit. Now, I think that there's one way to answer. I mean, your, your question is, very, is, is good in the sense that, of course, you could say that certain solutions to a given problem are... You can either give an answer that there are better solutions than other by using basically epistemic virtues in the sense that, well, that solution is more economic, that solution explains more things, that solution doesn't get you into specific troubles. I mean, that's mathematicians are very used to that also. That solution is more elegant than another one, more compelling. So either you can just use epistemic virtue narratives, but I keep saying, and that's why I keep I keep having my little historicist, culturalist background coming up from time to time. It's also about, if you take away just the formal aspect or beauty or elegance or efficiency of the theory, what does that theory really help you answer as a problem that might not be strictly a philosophical problem? And that's why a theory is very often linked to a certain moment in history and maybe sometimes even to a certain culture and maybe even to a certain language or whatever we see a culture is. And that, was one, that was my question, basically. And I think that is sometimes the point that allows us to decide. Today, like, take people who look at medieval distinctions between existence and essence, for instance. Historians today look at it very formally and say, OK, uh, real distinction, not real distinction. Uh, what's, the good, uh, what's the best possible argument from the point of view of semantics? Of course, a non-real distinction is much better. Okay, but how, if you ask yourself now as a historian, how did that question emerge? Well, then you actually realize that in the 13th century, for instance, it largely, or in Avicenna also, it largely emerged in a discussion with Kalam, uh, so with Islamic theology, about the question of explaining creation out of nothingness. That is a fundamentally not philosophical question, or at least it can be philosophical, but... So then I think you have a point to say which solution is better or not, because what the advantage or disadvantage is really, objectively, in the sense that, yes, um, real distinction, for instance, was a very efficient way to compatibilize philosophy with a creationist vision of the universe. Uh, because you were not committing yourself to any eternal essences, or you were not committing yourself to any... So from that, and that's why I keep thinking that I use Collingwood today just as an example, but I, I, I tend to quite think that we have to have a look at these fundamental presuppositions that sometimes are behind those metaphysical questions when we just we can just extract them as a problem and solve them as a toolbox, but actually they are linked to something bigger than themselves, yeah? and that probably gives you an answer. Uh, about advantages or disadvantages. And that's very often the term of truth when they ask me, yeah, so what solution is better? And I said, well, if you are a Christian creationist, you better take that one. <laughs> uh, but you can take the argument, I mean, we were talking about species. Uh, you know, I mean, why is there such an inflation today about, uh, about eternity or not eternity of species? I mean, come on, we have now a huge comeback of discussion, scientific discussion about racism, uh, racial differences, mm -hmm. it's, it's exploding, okay, and of course gender, yeah, so that, that's the elephant in the room behind, and of course, <laughs> in, in, in general, again here, that type of question which is outside of the ethereal world of philosophy, um, can tell you which solution it has more advantages, <coughs> depending on what you want really to actually promote, I don't know what you think about that, but... Mm. Uh, on the same question, from a from a slightly different point of view, you're absolutely right. But it's even before even compare possibilities. The fact that you say there are possibilities, it's because you think, okay, I should commit to possibilities. But 
you know, I was checking because in my last paper that is soon published, one of the referees said that makes no sense to commit to possibilities. He said, he said, we commit to constraint, and we de derive possibilities mm -hmm. from constraint. What are the constraint on on the metaphysical discourse, on the metaphysical different possibilities? Mm -hmm. So we would have to come to commit to some kind of norm of what is metaphysics, which is. We don't know what they could be because we have different positions and we try to compare them. So so it's even worse than what you said to my for me, because it's before even comparing the fact that I can say I can identify I can have a claim about what is the possible position, except historically saying this one, this one, up here, this one. It's because I already commit to some kind of norms to say this is a genuine possibility. This is a genuine metaphysical project. So, and by the way, the guy that arguing that, because I'm just checking, because it's John Devers uh, on modality. And yeah, thank you for this anonymous uh, referee that referred to me to an author I didn't know. <laughs> that you, you, there's no notion of possibilities without constraint. Mm -hmm. Can I jump on that, this this <coughs> as, as well? I, I, I like both of your your takes on it, but uh, but maybe just to continue on this, what, what you call a meta norm, I suppose earlier meta norm for metaphysics, the constraining of the possibility space, if, if that is a, a view that wants to be told. Now, you mentioned non-classical logics because my, my first answer is always well, you know, probably law and contradiction is a good starting point. Now, of course, even that goes if you... Well, exactly. So I directly wanted to give a hardcore... Uh, yeah. I, think is. I mean, look, I, mean, I, often, I often use that as a starting point because you have to start from, from somewhere. But, but I acknowledge the possibility of, uh, of, of non-classical logic <coughs> or logical pluralism of some, some form. Uh, but look, I mean, even non-classical logics will have axioms, will have oh, rules. Course, course. So, no, so you can. Everybody has senses. That's yeah. So, so, so you're still going to have a set of such oh, sort sure, of sure. such sort of metanorms. So, yeah. if we can at least agree that there are going to be constraints, uh, oh. and there could be competing systems of those constraints. But if you if you have a wide enough notion of possibility, it can it it, it can it can accommodate these things. Now, I mean, then the, the problem is: have you made any progress if everything? If everything, you know, everything, anything goes. Um, well, look, I mean, you still have to, whatever framework you're using here to, to constrain the possibilities, you're still going to have to make it compatible with the available evidence. So, which, I, I mean, comes mainly from science, I suppose, but just any, any kind of evidence that you accept into your, into your system. So, then, then you get into, into providing explanations based on, on the framework that that, that you've chosen here, <coughs> and uh, those explanations are going to be guided by some epistemic norms, perhaps, or cri criteria. Maybe we should call them norms. I mean, you, you can you can objectively say that this 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 position explains more uh, of the evidence that's that's available if it, if, it, if it indeed does so. And I suppose another meta norm that I would offer is something like Occam's razor, or if you like. Schaffer's laser version of that, you know, don't multiply fundamental entities beyond necessity. So, so you know, you can start constructing a, minim, a minimal set of uh, uh, meta norms like this. No, you know, they're not necessarily set in stone, but, uh, you know, I think we can make some progress. <laughs> I think also, but when you say the constraint are of science, scientific theories, scientific practices, Scientific experimentation, philosopher, we like theories because we don't understand that that much. <laughs> but what is the the norm coming from science? Is it practice? Well, it's, it's, it's evidence, it's evidence. It's, so it's and yes, it's, it's pretty much. But on the other hand, okay, your position seems to 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 sustain that you have need a, a block for uh, a conception of space time that is a block space time. Mm -hmm. Block space time could be understood when I look at the theory as a geometric entity. Mm -hmm. But not in practice. In practice, you need a clock <laughs> to measure stuff. Because you cannot presume in practice, in actual measurement, 
that that every fax is fixed or dependent of what you did. That's super determinism. And in that way, there's always a moment where you want to say that the fact that I switched the experiment that way has an impact on the result. Sure, but that, that would be a cost of adopting that kind of four-dimensional picture, I suppose. That yeah, but I'm just saying that even from my point of view, even if I take science as a strong constraint, mm -hmm. There's a lot more work that us philosophers were doing because we're just looking at theories. We're not, we're not looking a lot at scientific practice, scientific measurement, which also is a source of authority of science, epistemic authority. Yeah, that's true. I'm, so, I'm sure Peter looks at that as well. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Hmm. One more questions? Or comments? Or opinions. Uh, or metaphysics is good. Or constraints. Or constraints. <laughs> I'm going to ask my own question if I may. So uh, I was I wanted to come back to what uh, Jacob was saying about uh, the possibility to historicize meta metaphysics and the job of the historian compared to the job of a meta metaphysician. Mm -hmm. uh, in a way, I suppose that the divergence between an historian of metaphysics using metaphysics and met contemporary philosophizing metaphysics is on how um, you treat uh, historical uh, metaphysical system, right? Because if you're a metaphysician, <coughs> metaphysician today, you're probably trying to have some kind of narrative to support your preferred metaphysical position. Mm -hmm. Or if you're trying to, uh, if, you're, if you're more like a BBA, a BBA or a Lewis guy and trying to do equilibrium, equilibrium stuff and just sketch the equilibrium, the equilibrium that you sketch, uh, you will sketch them with some kind of narrative of how the system used to be. If you're doing neo-Aristotelian neo metaphysics, the, your equilibrium is historically situated now, but you're doing the history of the history of metaphysics that you take, will lead to this uh, equilibrium, but it's not necessarily the one that used to be uh, the Aristotelian position, right? So it's a different equilibrium that you associate with the older one because you have a narrative of history. And this way, I think, there you have the difference of do you respect history in a sense or do you betray it for the purpose of your own work? And I think I, 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 see, I see that there's a difference here in the tension. When uh, Thomas was uh, doing uh, the easy example of um, using Avicenna and Aristotle for quantum metaphysics, I don't know how much it's Aristotle in the text and how much you're respecting the text of Aristotle or how much you're betraying it for to fit contemporary purposes. So in this way, it's already historically situated, I'd say, I think, uh, in this way at least. And if it makes sense or no, no, it's, it's <laughs> closer to you. <laughs> is it? Well, it's well, it's well, no, because the example is. Because of this. So, so I mean, there was a lot that 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 is okay, but uh, I mean, was there your last suggestion that um, a question about what what we. What are we doing in cases like the one I presented, where where we take some supposed textual evidence and we kind of make it make it fair contemporary? <coughs> so, I mean, I, I'm I'm actively aware of the sort of uh, um, anachronistic uh, way of reading reading those classic texts, but uh, I think that. With the, with the kind of method that I have in mind, which we have talked about a little bit, uh, there isn't that big a problem with it because uh, if you are just mapping a position in the, in, in the logical or metaphysical space, if you like, uh, you're saying that, well, this is a better match with the evidence from, from for instance, contemporary science, uh, but it's still respects some of the metanorms, if you like, of that historical author. Mm -hmm. And then the question that I ended up with is, well, which of these metanorms or, or, or norms of, uh, of Aritano Aristotle would be more weighty? Uh, is, it, is it a commitment to this type of essentialist framework that denies substantial kind change, or is it this adoption of some like a four-dimensionalist picture? Is that compatible with it? So, so you're, you're, you're tweaking the classic picture and, and that's anachronistic, right? But you're using all the available evidence that, that these original historical authors didn't have. So you're kind of speculating, and I mean, it is just speculation. Well, what would they say now, you know, if they had the evidence 
bell flew to us. That's of course not what uh, historian of philosophy usually does from, from what I see, but, but I, I see some his colleagues no, doing that type of work who are interested in bringing in contemporary metaphysics no, and science as well. Mm -hmm. so, so, so then you can be upfront about, well, this is not something that uh, they meant or, or would have meant, and probably, you know, I, in a conference on, on, on Abhichan, I heard him say that well, he would be rolling in his grave if he had this, had this proposal, which, which, is, which is acknowledged uh, uh, you know, in a way that, that, that this is not compatible with that, that uh, original view. But yeah, as I say, as long as you're upfront about, about what you're doing, I don't see any real uh, problem with it. Uh, I, I mean, in a way, we're epistemically limited anyway. We will never know exactly <laughs> what the historical yeah. Yeah. If that think, makes sense. Yeah, I, I, I don't meant it as a mm. real problem. It's just that it's very cool here, but we are uh, drawing today, like using, using past, uh, when you're not really reading Aristotle, I still ask you the metaphysics today, mm. uh, but you, in the same equilibrium as I still was, and you're trying to just fit it to a uh, contemporary uh, evidence, so I'm doing a new equilibrium that is uh, historically situated, and that's a question that uh, Jacob was still, still mm -hmm. was asking about, mm -hmm. can we still assign the metaphysics? And in this way, is, is it not really like a, a real continuity, or is it necessarily historically situated in this sense? That's true. I mean, it, 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 these are basically questions I mean, to, 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 that I threw in the discussion myself. I'm not sure I have a good answer on that, but um, just to go a bit, to make maybe a strong claim about I mean, why we do that. It's not just a pick and choose thing, like uh, in the sense, oh, oh, I mean, that's very Oxford style. Oh, I found this great argument in Simplicius. Do you know that? <laughs> well, what the hell? Yeah, okay, maybe he made some argument about. No, so I think actually. The fact that we go back to, on a regular basis, not because we are in a big narrative of romantic narrative of science, Geschichte, or whatever, but sometimes we go back to history, just because to quote actually um, the late uh, Finnish great philosopher Simu Knutila, whom I had chance uh, to know a bit personally at one point, Knutila said he was once asked in a conference or in a seminar also, uh, why did you start doing this whole work on modalities and medieval philosophy? And he answered in his very sort of subtle and shy way, well, it's just because they have a much better logic than we have. <laughs> <laughs> uh, or at least it's just because we, they had a much better logic than, than at least what happens between Descartes and Kant. Mm. Where we know as historians how much logic has been deconstructed, and he said, well, Turnus' logic had potentialities that have been rediscovered by people like Peirce in particular, and then of course by the whole logical atomism in, in, in England, and then it exploded. And that's how the interest in terminist logic came back. Because we suddenly realized, and here we go back again about what the, what the theory can give you outside maybe of the pure philosophical realm. Well, uh, terminist logic, medieval terminist logic is just better than any logic textbook of 19th century Germany, uh, and, and only can speak about France. Uh, which, which French post-revolutionary authorities banned logic because they thought it's leading people to, to discussions and that's not good for the republic. <laughs> no, it's, I'm not kidding. The, the, the recommendations of the, of the French Ministry of Education in, in, after, after Napoleon was to scrap logic because, because it's leading to... Imagine, Imagine people from the Society of Metaphysics of Science would rule the country. That wouldn't work. I mean, they would be like ostracizing each other all the time. No, so, um, so Knutila said, no, actually, we go back. And, and of course, why is that? Well, because you, we have, you have the all new mathematical logic that develops from the 1910s and so on. <coughs> the new interest suddenly in the working of semantics, uh, independently of just psychology, as the, 19th century psychologist logic did, and that suddenly led a lot of people, and I think the Finnish school in particular was interesting from that point of view, to go back to it with fresh eyes and say, well, we'll we do it because it's actually just better logic than what we do now, okay? Other example, um, I was hinting at it, but I, I, I scrapped this little paragraph because I didn't want to be too long. I mean, what you do also from the pure point of view of medieval philosophy, for instance, is very close to a certain extent to what 
Claude Panaccio and people uh, in, in Quebec. Um, he was really the, the hero of a reconstructionist reading of the history of philosophy. He says we should just go back uh, in time and look at the best possible theory if it answers questions we have now, of course, and then we have all the debate about anachronism and so on. But I'm sure did it with the whole debate about uh, concept formation, you know, basically because, well, today we largely have in philosophy of mind causal theories of perception, and then new new causal theories of perception, and then you suddenly realize, yeah, well, this whole Descartes thing doesn't work, and this whole Kant thing is too complicated. We have no proof, scientific proof, of the existence of the categories. So what do we do with all that? Oh, God, the materials, they had a causal theory of the working of the mind. Of course, they had a bizarre concept of causality, and that's why I'm asking, are we talking about the same type of causality? Or are we not just completely mistaken? And uh, so we have in the field of medieval philosophy people who really hate each other because of that, because they say, oh yeah, look, they, they, they think there are medieval theories of intentionality and causal concept formation, and others say, no, that, that's not the point at all, they're not looking at that at all. They have just the concept of continuous nature and so on. But, um, so I, I think the answer, again, is a bit what, what I answered <coughs> this question is, it, what justifies it is, to a certain extent, maybe an extra philosophical demand, where you suddenly realize that in your philosophical toolbox, well, your old tradition, or the recent tradition you've been trained in, doesn't give you the right tools to answer. And that is why history of philosophy can remain refreshing. And it's not just a pick and shoot thing, but it's, it's really about realizing that, well, yeah, I mean, it's just when, like, when you drive in Brussels, you know, you, you sometimes just realize you're on the wrong road and you don't know how to get out, and then uh, you have to park the car and walk back and, 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 and go back in time and <laughs> take another road, you know. <laughs> a paper on Aristotle, I can die. <laughs> but, but when I was a physicist, a mathematician, what the, what's the point to do that? Because of course they are so historically situated in their natural philosophy that it's completely useless for so maybe a few ideas from there. Too. And when I switch to philosophy, I, I find it especially weird Then we think we can be in dialogue with someone of the past. Mm -hmm. Like, their concepts are not situated as much as scientific concepts, which is a bizarre position. And when I moved to France and be professor, I discovered historical epistemology, mm -hmm. which is exactly that, which is saying you should never do that because, of course, every words that these people use have no connection to recognition to the one we use, except in a very long study about how it changed progressively, blah, blah, blah. So we should never, never go back to philosophy like we do, like a toolbox or like a, uh, like a, like we were in dialogue with these, these, these people of the past. So I don't know, because if, 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 if they are right about concept, language is completely situated in a culture, Maybe we're not using, we're only using Aristotle as a toolbox, which would be... It's not the way philosophy think, we think about ourselves. We think we are in a, in a continuous project since at least the Greek. I'm usually careful to say that, that I, I use some Aristotelian ideas as an inspiration for... Yeah. But, you know, I... I do like the idea of being, being in dialogue with historical... <laughs> that, that's part of our community, the way we think ourselves. So if we were wrong about that, that would be a high cost. But how is your, just, just the person, how is your own work on Avicenna received when you go to an Avicenna Congress? Mine? Yeah. Well, I mean, I was, I was part of this, this conference as a contemporary metaphysician commenting on, comment on Avicenna scholarship. Mm -hmm. But, I mean, we found lots of continuity there, but 
but probably that was because uh, it was a sort of very uh, understanding <laughs> environment <laughs> that tried to bring together contemporary okay. metaphysics and historical uh, work. Um, but, uh, I mean, if we're, if we're going to read the historical work in the first place, we're going to have to use some conception of the, of the theoretical philosophical notions that are in play, such as you know, essence or modality or what have you. So to assume that there's no continuity would, would equally be, uh, be mistaken, uh, because of, of course we've inherited those notions from, from this historical mm -hmm. scholarship. Now, of course, they've changed over over time, but uh, uh, you know, again, if we're sort of upfront about those epistemic limitations, I don't see any, uh, anything wrong with, <laughs> with, with being in dialogue with the historical authors because we can't be in an actual dialogue with them. Maybe we can construct an AI model that, that has this. <laughs> <laughs> but you see how the scientists would say there, there, there is irregular ruptures in the evolution of concept of word mass energy mm. whatever yeah but there's continuity empirical continuity so they try to save the empirical part and there's a, a cumulative technology so so technology of 16th century they still work they are not you as good as today but they still work it's not because everything they believe about the world is false mm. according to design that their technology did not work mm. so so scientists would would go back and say, oh okay not about concepts, not about the content, mm -hmm. just about these empirical prediction or technology. Us philosopher, you know, when even when I talk of essence, it's not exactly the Aristotelian because you know I accept more properties than Aristotle, but it's, I hope it's pretty close. And maybe I'm completely wrong about that. So be it. <laughs> <laughs> But, well, what if, you're, what if you're a Platonist, right? And, and Plato was right about, uh, you know, Anamnesis and, and, and uh, Platonic Heaven. <coughs> we are actually in contact with the very okay, same okay. ideas. <laughs> yeah, okay, fair enough. Fair enough. Yeah. So he does uh, meta, meta, metaphysical. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I have, a, I have a quick and dirty remark about all this, you know. Uh, I tend to believe that it is a human nature. And the human nature, I mean, our perceptual apparatus, the way we think and we reason, uh, has, seems to me hasn't changed that much since the time of Aristotle. Whereas of science did, mm -hmm. like the, the science did. And so this, at least, you know, this naturalism is said that there is in some sense a, 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 a human nature. At least explains to some extent that we can dialogue not only with Aristotle, you know, and uh, a very ancient philosophers, but also with other human traditions, like, you know, Indian philosophy, Chinese philosophy, and things like that. Well, it takes some effort, you know, to figure, because you are not used to it, but it's possible. I mean, we, we can understand, you know, and we can get uh, uh, things out of them, and, uh, yeah. So I think there is, uh, there is a human nature in some sense. There is something which endures, uh, in our species, you know, and uh, our biological species, you know, biologically we didn't change that much, you know, in 2,000, 3,000 years, and there are that many differences between uh, Indians, Chinese, and uh, other people than we are. But I would agree about the body, mm -hmm. but the language, culture, that's something else. I don't oh, know that right. that's complicated because. Um, Kind of Wittgenstein, you know, language is as complicated as biology. It's something that we don't understand. You can learn Sanskrit, you can learn. Yeah, but you can learn am Chinese. I able to understand Sanskrit like they are? <laughs> or am I doing some kind of bizarre translation? Uh, when I was a student, you know, I took a, a, a course on Sanskrit. Huh? Was the, the worst. Well, the most difficult course I ever took. <laughs> <laughs> Awful. I mean, just. Uh, but well, I mean, you, 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 if you, you work, you work hard, you, you get something. Out of it. You can understand, you know, uh, some bits of the Bhagavad Gita, you know, the Veda, and things like that. Okay. Mm -hmm. It's a very different language. Well, it's Indo-European. You would, uh, you would reply, but. Uh, <laughs> 
Reconstruction. I, I don't know if it's if it's um, if it's actually doable. Uh, full stop. Um, uh, and as an, as an, as I, I don't have that metaphysical sort of claim when I do practice history of philosophy uh, myself. I, I can assume it as, a, as an hypothesis, but I don't have that claim, which was a very strong claim in a certain German tradition in particular, that you actually really have to to sort of uh, yeah get into the mind of the people you study by speaking the language and even that's why I gave the example of Vilanovic, which is fun. It's not just by learning Sanskrit. It's really by yeah, actually yeah. Um, uh, performing the rituals, eating Indian food all day and, and, and that's it. You convert it basically. Yeah. Which is then a kind of a role for if you're doing historicist uh, history of philosophy because I, mean, I think about uh, <coughs> Science would be cool, and be cool. the idea of doing history that you should put yourself, put your mind inside the multidisciplinary matrix that the people were picking with at the time. And if you can do that, you can do history of uh, science, uh, it was science. But if you can't do that at all, then but the project of history of philosophy is a bit harder, right? You have to reconceive a lot of stuff because what you're doing is not exactly wrong. Or at least you, know, you, have, you have no sanity about what you are interpreting out of history. Is exactly what was said at that time, right? Well, uh, two or three weeks ago in the same room we had, a, I think, I wasn't there, but I was told we had a strong discussion about, I think, I don't know who was there, the, the talk by Fabien Muller. Were you there? I am. Yeah. Across the way. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. We had a strong discussion about the same thing, where well, basically um, what is Aristotle talking about when he talks about metaphysics and God? Well, um, some people felt attacked <laughs> because uh, they saw metaphysics as a formal science and as a, the ancient root of ontology and blah blah blah, blah which is a standard reading basically, up to yours I mean, to a certain extent. And Fabian Müller, who is a comparative um, scholar and who is doing Hindu, Hindu ancient philosophy and compares it with Greek, he was of course taking the, the stance that everything in Aristotle's metaphysics had nothing to do with all what we call scholastic constructions of essences and ontology. It has just to do about worshipping the gods and, and transforming ourselves in a sort of inner catharsis and that the Aristotelian ethics has nothing to do with a sort of um, 
more a philosophy, but it is actually a spiritual transformation of the soul. And so, so <laughs> it was clearly the, the same idea that. So I don't know. I mean, it's not my practice of philosophy. I'm not trying to. Um, I'm I'm I'm, re I'm reading texts as signs of something, and since they're reread, I'm interested basically in the reason why people reread them. And I, I work on the scholastic, late scholastic tradition, which is actually it's a, is it's a good point to I mean it's a it's a good effort to try that out because you see that they read it again and again and again. The, medieval, the Arabs have read it, the Hebrews have read it, the, the medievals have read it. Then you read it again, and we read it again. So I'm really interested in the discrepancies of, of these readings. What do they see, and what we don't see, and to what extent is what they see still in a certain way? Framing our way of looking at these things. Yeah, that's why I think it's also important to look at the 20th century historiography very often because the problems that we have been bequeathed by, like medieval studies, for instance, as you and or Aristotelian studies, is linked to certain ideological constraints <laughs> of either neo-Thomism or anti-idealism in the 19th century, and we should be aware of that also. Yeah. The reason why we rediscovered these texts, the whole story of neo aristotelianism is very interesting to read. And so they not only give us the text, but also a certain amount, a certain number of preset questions. I mean, those who revived Aristotle in the 19th century in Europe were basically all anti-Kantians, anti whether, whether German, Polish, or Belgian. Especially our founders. And our founders, of <laughs> course. <laughs> So they, they gave us also a number of questions with that. Yeah. And we need to be aware of that. Uh, it's the only way also, I think, to chase anachronisms. I cannot make any more bigger metaphysical claims about what Aristotle felt when he wrote that uh, the first principle is pure joy. <laughs> there was a question? Yeah. Yes. So, it's to, to, to you now that you are talking already, and I have a question about the, the, what you're talking about now. Is the the normative aspect of your radical empiricism, which is what you, how you work uh, with uh, when, you do, when you do history of philosophy, is that not that we should be looking for what Collingwood calls absolute presuppositions? Because radical empiricism is not that you can just write an article on any topic. You can take uh, the physics of Suarez and write an article about the category of Ubi. But rather, there's, there's a claim, there's a normative claim in, in, in this methodology, you have to be looking for what is important in the history of philosophy. No, 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 I'm not claiming that. I think you can work on things that are not important at all. I wrote an article on, 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 on flies, you know, in the Middle Ages, so, and they're not important. <laughs> um, now, flies are very often given as an example for relations, because how, 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 you read, how very small items relate to other big items. But, um, no, I think that's not a claim I would make. I mean, you don't... What are you looking for when you do radical empiricism in the history of philosophy? Okay, that's a better question. Um, well, I, I could give a Wittgensteinian answer, and it's a sort of disease, <laughs> in the sense that if you think of philosophy as an you said that, I think, Alexander, that uh, there's an evolution still to a certain extent that we live ourselves as philosophers since ancient Greeks, still as somehow part of a, of a tradition, and whether that is linked to human nature, at least it's linked to a certain shared language that we have, at least in our tradition. So if you assume that's true, then I think the radical empiricism, for me, the point is really, but that's, I'm just talking about what I do now, so that's not interesting, it's not the point for today. It's really that if we have that history, we need to write in the most adequate way, empirically, that is, the way these ideas and concepts or problems have actually been transmitted in time. Against all these narratives of big like changes and big ruptures and big revolutions and new paradigms, I think that's what is, I think, interesting in having a very empirical approach, is by claiming that 
there is no creation ex nihilo in the history of philosophy. So every idea comes from another one, and you just need to track down from which one it comes exactly. And that is how you can. I mean, that's that's the point. Medieval philosophy is really exciting. I think in, among different periods of history of philosophy, because people of the last hundred years have made progress, have made historical progress. If you look at what textbooks in the, and it's, I'm not sure it's the same in like 19th century philosophy, and it's not a criticism, I'm just realizing we came from, we came from a very bad situation. When you look at what the time of Mercier, for instance, they were writing about Aquinas replying, sort of replying to God knows what, we now realize it's wrong. <laughs> it, it's wrong, Aquinas was not replying to those people Mercier believed he was replying. Because we have been able to prove it empirically through the text, through the documents, through the arguments, through the language. And that <coughs> eventually will give you, I think, a better picture of what was really at the stake. And then only you get to the absolute presupposition. I'm not looking immediately at the absolute presupposition as, as being the sort of graal of the philosopher I'm trying to, to look for. Mm -hmm. More questions? He does not look satisfied. <laughs> <laughs> We can continue the discussion afterwards. <laughs> comments? No? No question, no comments? Do you have yeah. comments on your presentation, <coughs> maybe? We still have a bit of time. We still have 20 minutes if you ask. I don't think it's good. I thought it was too full. I agree with my colleagues. <laughs> That's refreshing. We are, we are in full agreement. That's refreshing. Oh, yeah. <laughs> no, not about, <laughs> about what is important. Well, about you can stay a realist if you want. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Actually, I think there was something that uh, Jacob just said that I think it's is quite interesting. He said that you can have empirical evidence of history, so then you can do metaphysics of history in, some, in the same way that you can do metaphysics of science. Right? And it would be a way to uh, discuss this question of continuity in a sense. No? If you are doing metaphysics of history, to solve the question of continuity into the metaphysics of science. Just wrong. <laughs> so, if you guys, no more questions and no more comments. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much for the discussion. Thank you. Thank you.